The church believes very much that the sinner lays his hand upon the lamb, confesses his sin, that lamb is slain, which is the cross, and that sinner goes home forgiven. They love all that. They're all happy with the type up to this point, but that's where they stop. Why? Because they don't want to believe that their sin remains on record. They don't want to answer in the judgment. They just want to believe they're saved at the cross, they're saved with the sacrifice. But the type doesn't end there. The purpose of the study today is to show that our salvation or atonement was not complete at the cross. Very important. Now, don't misunderstand me, of course, the cross. Without the cross, no one's saved. So I'm not in any way criticizing that, of course, not for a moment. But many Christians, in fact, millions of Christians who believe in the cross are going to be lost. We'll actually see that in one of the first few slides. And unfortunately, it's also true that for, for many, becoming a Christian is actually a lot easier than remaining one. For example, the parable about the sower. Jesus talks about the seed that fell on the stony ground and on the thorny ground, describing Christians who receive the gospel with joy. But then sadly, because of the cares of this world life and, and because of the trials, they're offended because of the word. So although they received it with joy, although they walked in the truth, unfortunately other worldly factors drowned out that, that love they had. So this is what I mean by it. sometimes it's easier. It's a sad thing to say, but it's a reality. Anyone who's been in the church for any period of time would know that. But from, even from our own personal Personal experiences, there's times when we struggle, but also we see brethren come in and we rejoice and then we don't see them anymore. So, and of course the Lord tells us in the last days, the love of many will wax cold. What I'm going to present today, most of you already know these things, so it's not new, although there's some principles I've brought out that may be a little bit uh, new, but because Evie's audience is, is different to previous ministries, that we've been part of and we're attracting people who different walk in their walks in their life or different parts of their journey um, or maybe not believe exactly the way we do on certain aspects like the sanctuary or the judgment etc or the commandments and so it could be very helpful for others who join us even though we have other beautiful things and truths in common and the study is going to be focused on well, originally, anyway, I was going to do a study on the Day of Atonement, Leviticus 16, and the book of Hebrews, and show the amazing connections, but that got a bit technical, and I thought I'd better leave that for now and just do something a bit more simple. So we're going to look at some of the Old Testament types, types of the gospel, and they're going to help us understand the plan of salvation, and especially the role we play in the plan of salvation. It's not just about Jesus and the cross, of course, we know that as well, but the types bring that out even clearer. Now, a type is something that prefigures the truth, of course. For example, in the Old Testament, the lamb that was slain, of course, represents Christ, the lamb of God, who would die on the cross for us. And the Old Testament worshippers, they knew this, of course. They knew that there was no forgiveness in the blood of a lamb. But it testified. In fact, we're told that the, the bleeding victim on the altar of sacrifice testified of the Redeemer to come. We also have Old Testament types like the priesthood, the sanctuary, the sprinkling of the blood, which is what this study is about, partially. And these, these types, like the priesthood, sanctuary, sprinkling of the blood, they go way past the cross. The types don't end with the cross. And then you continue on, teaching more valuable lessons regarding the plan of salvation. For example, Pentecost, priest of Pentecost. You know, it was uh, seven Sabbaths after the second day of unleavened bread. And of course, we know that was the, had a partial fulfillment in Acts chapter 2, the Pentecost, when Peter's wonderful sermon brought a harvest of 3,000 souls. It was, the, it was the feast of first fruits of the harvest, great celebration. And we know that it also has a greater fulfillment with the latter rain, when the whole world 
will be harvested, or at least the believers anyway. Uh, the priesthood, of course, a type of Christ, the Levitical priesthood. And of course, he's in Hebrews, we're told in chapters 5, 6, and 7, he's after the order of Melchizedek, a greater priesthood. And nonetheless, Aaron and his sons were types of Christ, and especially their ministry, their functions. And as we study those things, we get an idea of what Jesus is doing today for us in the sanctuary. And by understanding that, we can see what the people were doing as the high priest was ministering for them, so we can also cooperate with Christ in that work. Another example is the Day of Atonement, of course, which, of course, is the Day of Judgment. And that, of course, prefigures that great antitypical Day of Atonement. You know, Paul says in Acts 17, where God has appointed a day when he will judge the world in righteousness by that man by whom he has ordained. In other words, through Christ, the whole world will be judged. So the New Testament brings out these, these uh, figures of the old and shows you the, the gospel relation to it. The Bible even gives us a time prophecy in Daniel 8.14 regarding the day of atonement, when it's to begin, when it was to begin. The Day of Atonement is so important in Scripture that the Bible devotes an entire chapter to it. Leviticus 16, entire chapter, to its functions, what the priest would do on that day. Very intricate. And especially the part the nation would play as the priest was making atonement for them. So we can, we can learn a lot from studying these types. Another example, in Exodus 25, 8, when God said to Moses, let them build me a sanctuary that I might dwell among them. And we see a partial fulfillment of that when the, when the tabernacle was built and the shine of kind of glory, the presence of God would be above the mercy seat and God dwelt with his people. That had a greater fulfillment in when Christ came to man. In John 1.14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That word dwelt means he tabernacled among us. And we behold his glory, the glory of the only begotten Son of God, full of grace and truth. That's what the Shekinah glory was teaching. That one day God would not dwell in a tent, but in person with his people. And of course, that too has a greater fulfillment when God and his people will be one and they'll tabernacle together in heaven. So you can see some beautiful spiritual lessons with these things. In the book of Hebrews, which some of you will know is my favourite book, I've read it for years, it reveals that Jesus is the fulfilment of all these types of the Old Testament deal. Of course, he's the true high priest, ministering in a true sanctuary with a better sacrifice. And he's accomplishing what the Old Covenant sacrificial service could not do, and that is taking away our sins affecting the worshipper. And that's what this title is about, the blood sprinkled and the blood applied. That's what it means. You see the blood sprinkled, we're going to see a little bit later. It refers to the blood of Jesus. And it covers the repentant sinner. The sinner receives forgiveness, but his sins remain on record. We'll see that very clearly. This is what's being denied today. That's why it's important. Every single human being who's ever lived has confessed their sins to God. Is part of this category. They have had the blood of Christ sprinkled, covering their sins. But the blood applied is much greater. The blood applied is also the blood of Jesus. It's the life of Christ. That doesn't just bring forgiveness, but it cleanses the life from sin. And therefore, the record of sin is erased. This category applies only to those who are going to be saved. So you need both, friends. Saved at the cross is not going to cut it. It's not enough. And that's what this study is about. Salvation isn't easy for God. It's not easy for us. The Lord said, no, is the way that leads to life. If you don't be that find it. He says, and Luke, strive that you enter into the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. So it's not, it's not as easy as some people think it is. And we need to understand these, there are conditions that are gospel and to attaining heaven. And it's better to know it now rather than when it's too late. For example, when sin began in heaven with holy angels, what happened? They were cast out. When sin began in, on earth in Eden with the holy pair, what took place? 
they were cast out. That should just alone, that should teach you something. Not going, there's going to be no sin in heaven, friends. That's what started the problem in heaven. And this is what ministers should be telling us, telling the people. And the holy pair, Adam and Eve, their posterity, if they continue in sin, of course, they're not going to go into heaven, but they'll be ultimately destroyed as well. So, serious doctrine. And of course, what is sin? 1 John 3, 4, the transgression of the law. Now we see also that sin had started this whole mess and no one's going to enter into sin. In fact, those who did sin were cast out of heaven. No one's going to enter into heaven with sin. And it is the transgression of God's law. So now we see that the commandments are the standard by which God will judge every human being. You know, Proverbs, I think it's 16, 12, it says, there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the way therein leadeth to death. And unlike many other religions in the world, especially New Age and Eastern religions, that teach there are many ways to this so-called heaven, Jesus taught us there's only two, there's only two paths, friends. And every human being is on one of his two paths. There's not many ways. The Lord said, that's what I mean by salvation isn't easy. Enter ye at the straight gate. For wide is the gate that is broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be which will go in thereat. And then he says, because straight is the gate, that's it's a strict path, friends, and it's a narrow way that leads unto life. And the few there be that find it. So here we see two paths set before us, and every single one of us right now, and every human being in the world right now, regardless of what they believe or don't believe, are on one of these two paths. They're heading to hell or to salvation. And unfortunately, this is why I'm doing this study, there are many professed Christians who are thinking they're on the right path. Of course, I'm not judging anyone, but I'm just simply stating the truth. In fact, the next verse is going to show us this, same chapter as Matthew 7. They think they're on the right path and yet they're heading for destruction. Notice this. And these aren't just your ordinary Christians either. These are some Christians who in the world would have been extremely highly regarded. Notice what the Lord Jesus says. After, after he just finished telling us that the straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, the few the bit of find it, he says, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. I see that door at the will of my Father, which is in heaven. He says, many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, we have, not prophes- have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. It's almost like they're giving a resume. When I read this, it's, to me, it's, it's, it's these people, that at this point, they know. That's why they're saying, we've done all these things. They know they're lost. We, as the Lord answers, and I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you don't work iniquity. Remember, we saw what this, the commandments will be the standard of the judgment for people being saved or lost. And, the, and, the, and sin is the transgression of the law. Look what Jesus says to them. Depart from me, you don't work iniquity. I never knew you. That word iniquity means lawlessness. Most translations translate it that way. You that work lawlessness. You that break the law. That's what he's telling them. How important then is it that we now understand the truth about the judgment? You see, these people thought they were right with God. They're speaking about the wonderful things they did in God's name. They were certain they were going to heaven. And then they hear those faithful words, I never knew you. They had confessed their sins the atoning blood of Christ was sprinkled in their behalf. Some of these people here, I believe, were great ministers who were baptizing and evangelizing. They had certainly made a commitment to the gospel themselves. The blood was sprinkled on their behalf, all right. But it was never applied in their life. And the judgment shows that the record wasn't cleansed. They judged as lawbreakers and they're lost. That's how serious the doctrine of the judgment is. And how important it is that we understand it. You think that these professed Christians here thought they were going to be judged? They would have mocked that sermon like I'm going to present today. They do mock at them. They, all they talk about is we're under grace. You're a legalist. You have to keep the law. But I'm saying that here. 
in the Lord, face to face with the Lord, they're not thinking that anymore. That's what I mean why it's better to know the truth now. It's never too late. Well, one day it will be at that, at that point there it is, but until then. Only true repentance, friends, brings forgiveness. It says in Proverbs 28, 13, Whosoever covereth his sin shall not prosper, but he that confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. You've heard me say this before, but I think it's really relevant. If we only needed, because everyone says we're saved by the cross, we're saved by Christ, etc. I was saved on a particular day. And I'm not saying that's not true. Of course, it's true to a degree. But we're going to see that it's more than just accepting Christ at the cross and being baptised. There's a part we have to play. And Jesus is clearly telling these people they didn't play that part. They were saying they were doing all these things. He's, when he says, I never knew you, you, he meant that we're going to finish with this same passage anyway. We'll see that a bit more. But if we only needed Christ's sacrifice for our sins, if that's all we needed, according to the gospel to most teach today and believe, then Jesus could have come here as an adult, lived a few days, etc., maybe done a little bit of teaching, die on the cross and go back home. There's your sacrifice. There's your forgiveness. He comes here as an infant. He lives a life of 33 and a half years from an infant to a child to a youth to perfect manhood every moment of his life, perfecting his humanity, suffering, being tempted, learning obedience by the things which he suffered as a root out of a dry ground, a man acquainted with grief and a man of sorrows, etc. Why? Building the temple of the Lord. Why? So he can impart that victorious life that he lived in that becoming temptation and impart it to us, his righteousness. It's imputed to us for our forgiveness and it's imparted to us for our salvation. Notice the order. Look at this in Hebrews 5. Look at the order. Though he were a son, though he's the son of God. Look at the next word. The son of God had to learn obedience by the things which he suffered. I guess 1 Peter 4, 1, it says, He that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Ceased from sin. This is why people don't want to, friends. They don't want to keep the commandments. That they know it requires suffering. And so they look for a cheap, a, a, a simpler gospel of a church that teaches that you can live in the world and still be saved, basically. The Bible says that though he was the son of God, he had to learn obedience. How? Through the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. That's why he had to live that perfect life and go through all those trials and sacrifice, etc. To be made perfect, bring that perfect life to the cross and pay for the sins of the world, not for the Christians, for the world. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing the trespasses against them. And now he becomes the author of eternal salvation unto all them to obey him. This is why the truth about the comforter also is so important. So we need more than just his sacrifice, friends. We need his life. Beautiful verse, these two, Romans 5, 9 and 10. Much more being justified by his blood. Look what he goes on to say. We shall be saved by his life. <laughs> there you see the the same principle, the blood sprinkled, the blood applied. You see them both. We're reconciled by his death, but that's not enough. That's just the cross. That's the sacrifice. That's, that's pinnacle. But we're saved by his life. That's why being made perfect, he became the offer of eternal salvation. That's why he had to live that life. In other words, Jesus' sacrifice pays for our sins. That's the blood sprinkled. And his life is what saves us from our sins. That's the blood applied. Today, Christians, they desire his sacrifice, but not his life, unfortunately. Jesus says, they draw near to me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They desire the cross on their behalf, for, them, for their behalf. But they, don't des- but they deny the cross on his behalf. You ever thought about that? This is really sad, you know. It's, it's very true, but it's very sad. All Jesus' suffering, all the sacrifice that he had made and is making and all that heaven is working right now and the Father and the Son in order to save all this, 
souls. And for many, it'll be in vain. And yet you have professed Christians who, with the talents God's given us, or the means he's given us, the abilities we have, how much do we sacrifice? How much of the cross do we take up? Because what I'm trying to say is, friends, what I'm trying to say is that we can help Christ. When you think about that thing, how can we help the omnipotent one? We can help him. Because Jesus wants to save as many as he can. He doesn't want his sacrifice to be in vain, and he needs our help to do that. In the sense of, God doesn't need anyone, but in the sense of that because man has a free will, because man can choose to obey or disobey God, because we've tasted of, of the grace that brings us salvation, we can be a testimony and a witness for Christ and we can use our efforts, the abilities he's given us and the talents he's given us to have an influence over our friends, our loved ones and the stranger in the street, those we work with. And in doing so, we help the gospel and therefore we're, we're working with heaven and helping others to come to, to the truth. But for many, that sacrifice is too great. That's what I mean by they want the cross on their behalf, but they won't take up the cross on, on heaven's behalf. It's, it's sad, and we've got to be careful about that ourselves. I'm not talking about the world. We need to be careful of that. If God places opportunities in front of us, be careful of what motives are keeping you from seeing that opportunity where you can do more for the God, or for the church, or for the work, and take hold of it. Don't hold back, friends. We must never forget that the cross without the resurrection means nothing. To die with him means that you also live with him. And the reason today that doctrines like the commandments and the judgment are so controversial and are attacked so much by other churches is because these doctrines rightly teach that your life is going to be examined and you're going to be judged according to the commandments, which is the standard of that judgment and people don't like that. This is why they like to just be saved by grace, saved at the cross and not go past this point. But scripture brings this out very clearly. This is just a few verses. My brother Tom actually presented a similar message to this not last time or, we, or the second last time we all gathered here. So this is just, I'm not going to spend much time here. We're familiar with these verses, but just to show the binding claims of the commandments and how they'll be the standard of God's judgment. Solomon, in writing Ecclesiastes, and his, basically the entire wisdom of the world is he's encapsulating it in this one text. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. So if you wanted to sum up the, all the wisdom of the, of, the, of the Bible in one verse, this would be the one. With all the wisdom that God gave to Solomon, in one verse he's telling you what your duty is. Fear God and keep his commandments. Why? For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing. This is why the commandments are spiritual. They judge the, the motives behind the thoughts and the actions. Whether it be good or whether it be evil. And in the New Testament, James 2, 11 and 12, quoting the commandments, he says, do not commit adultery. He who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. Now, if you commit, do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. And then he says, so speak and act as those who are going to be judged under the law of liberty. So again, we see that the law, the Ten Commandments, is the standard by which everyone will be judged. Paul in 2 Corinthians 5.10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that, what he has done, whether it be good or bad. So all our decisions, the actions we've taken, the things we've done, good or bad, are going to be appear in the judgment. Apostle Paul's telling you that, friends, not me. And as Paul was striving with Felix, he reasoned of righteousness and temperance. As we know, these men like Felix were powerful, wealthy people, and they were anything but temperate. And of what? Paul speaking many years after the cross. He reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and of judgment to come. Judgment was future. Of course it was. Judgment was not finished at the cross, friends. And of course, Felix trembled. He was certainly convicted. Not only is the judgment future, it also takes place after you die, not while you're alive. It doesn't mean the moment you die, I'm not saying that, but it takes place after you die, and of course that makes sense as well, because while you're alive, 
unless you've committed the unpardonable sin, you can choose to be saved at last. You can turn from your righteousness, like it says in Ezekiel 18, or you can turn from your wickedness, etc. God is still striving with you. As the apostle says in Hebrews 9.27, it's appointed other men once to die. But after this, the judgment. So again, we're seeing the judgment is way future of the cross. And when does it end? This is interesting. When does the judgment end? Apostle Peter says, repent to be converted that your sins may be blotted out. When? Obviously for them to be blotted out, the judgment had to take place. When? When he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. So Peter's telling us there that the sins are blotted out in the judgment a short time before the Lord returns. In the times of refreshing, it sets up a lot of rain the last days. Peter also tells us that the judgment begins with the church, with the house of God. And he says, if it first begin with us, what shall be the envy of them that obey not the gospel of God? And then he actually goes on to say, if scarcely the righteous be saved. That's how serious the matter it is. So we're seeing the judgment is future. We're seeing it takes place after you die. And we see that it takes place not long before the second coming of Christ. And of course, the end of the judgment, obviously, is also the end of probation. No more probation because judgment is over. And that's what Jesus is declaring here in Revelation 22 when he says these words. He's the high priest. He's finished his intercession. He's finished mediating on behalf of man. And now he declares these words. Now at this point, those who are alive on earth, their destiny is fixed. Cannot change. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Obviously for the Lord to declare the ones who were unjust and those who were holy means that judgment had to take place. An investigation into their character, of course it did. And of course this declaration is made very end of probation. The latter rain has fallen, the message has gone to the world. <clears throat> gospel of this kingdom shall be preached into all the world for a witness and the end shall come. People have made the decisions for the mark of the beast or the seal of God and the characters are fixed for it, and the judgment is fixed. And they're going to be rewarded according to their works, good or bad, as Paul saw what we saw there in 1 Corinthians 5. For everything done in the body, whether good or bad, appearing before the judgment seat of Christ. The Lord says, I'll come quickly my, and my reward is with me. Judgment has ended, now he's coming quickly. The plague's going to fall and he's going to come. To give every man according as his work shall be. So there we see that they're judged according to their works. So how can we say there's not a judgment? And who are the ones that pass this judgment? It tells you, two verses later. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and enter in through the gates into the city. You could say the gospel ends here in Revelation 22, the way it began. Adam and Eve broke God's commandments. They sinned against God and they lost the right to the tree of life. At the end of earth's history, God's people are keeping his commandments and once again have the right to the tree of life. So a quick summary. We've seen that your life's history remains on record to be judged. We've seen that that judgment takes place after you die. We've seen that the commandments are going to be the standard for that judgment. And the blinding out of sin takes place way after the cross, in fact, just before the sin coming. And when that judgment ends, probation closes. And in that judgment, friends, there's only two categories. As the Lord said, they're holy or unjust. God's no respecter of person. You're either judged to be righteous or unjust. You're either keeping the commandments or you're breaking them. That's why we saw verse 14, blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and enter through the gates into the city. This is why to say that the cross doctrine is misleading. I mean, a person can use that term, that's fine. But if you're using that term as far as the doctrine is concerned to deny a judgment, to deny a record of, remains, of sin remains, etc., then it's, it's more than misleading, it's deceptive. The cross, I'll repeat, cannot save anybody unless they also experience the resurrection. That's exactly what Jesus was telling Nicodemus that night when he shared the gospel with him. Twice he told him, unless thou be born of water and the spirit, thou cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. 
unless there's that regeneration, unless there's that born again experience, unless that old man and his deeds dies and remains under the water and the new creation comes up, behold, a new creation, all things become new, old things have passed away. Unless that experience takes place, friends, the cross is not going to help you. As I said before, Matthew 7, those people who believe in the cross, all right, they preach the cross. But the Lord says, I never, never knew you. In Romans 6, Paul repeatedly speaks about being crucified with Christ, dying with Christ, and being risen with him. Repeatedly, like six verses in a row, he says that. And that's what baptism is supposed to mean. And when we see that, it's the most beautiful thing in the church because when you see a person, regardless of their age, but especially young people, and they make that decision to turn from the world and to follow the Saviour, and you see God working in their life, and you see how he's transforming them, and you see the blessing as they present from the Bible, it's the most joyous thing. You can actually see a transformation before your eyes. Wonderful witness. Greatest joy. But the scripture goes on to tell, tell us, the Bible teaches us that we need to be on guard. Now, Peter tells us to be to watch and be sober. Jesus says, hold fast thy crown. Hold fast what thou hast, that no man take your crown. Paul tells us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. These are solemn warnings, friends. Look at the Apostle Paul, what he says here. I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Best by any means what I have taught to others, I be cast away. So much for being saved at the cross. The greatest Christian that ever lived had to be watchful and keep his body in subjection, remain surrendered, lest he feared being cast away. Sadly today, instead of the church preaching the gospel to the world, the gospel has to be preached to the church. This is just reality. We're going to have a brief look now at what it means for the blood to be sprinkled and applied. And as I said earlier, when we look at the types in the Old Testament. But we're going to begin in the New Testament with this, this verse, a powerful verse. This verse is the most important verse in the study today. For me, it's one of the most important verses in all the Bible. It means exactly what it says, and yet no one, friends, hardly anyone understands this verse. Amazing. I have not, I could be wrong, but I personally have not read a commentary that explains this verse correctly. In fact, their commentary on this verse is ridiculous. I'm being respectful about it, it's ridiculous. It's actually contradictory what they say. And I mean the great men like Barnes and the rest of them. Great men of great knowledge and wisdom. They haven't got a clue what this text is saying. It means what it's saying, I'm not gonna twist anything. But if you don't understand the types of the Old Testament, you'll never understand what this verse is saying. Notice it says, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Now the commentaries will tell you that Jesus is repairing the second time without sin, his sin. And then they say, oh yeah, it's his sin, but he doesn't have any sin. It's so confusing and ridiculous. And, and they'll, they'll write like two paragraphs and you haven't got a clue what they're talking about. Friends, Jesus is our sin bearer, yes, but he never had sin. Of course, everyone agrees with that. But it says he's, he's coming the second time from heaven without sin unto salvation. To who? To them that look for him, that looking to him. When we go to the Old Testament and we look at the Day of Atonement now, you're going to see how beautiful this is, how clear it is. Let me ask you a question here. Jesus is coming back without sin. That's what it says. Whose sin is he coming back without? Obviously not his own. Again, we'd all agree with that. So it cannot be his sin. It tells you his, It tells you that. Unto them that look to him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Question. Those people that are looking to him at the second coming, are they saved? Absolutely. But it says that he's coming to, to them without sin. They look to him without sin unto salvation. Of course they're saved. They're looking to him. They're, they're, um, it says in Colossians 3, 1, it says, um, set your affection on the things above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. And, and our, our, our life is hid with Christ and God, etc. They're looking to him. They're looking to the work he's doing. They're, 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 they're faithful. They're following their master. And of course they're saved. So the people that look for him at his second coming are saved. Yes, 
Has atonement been made for them? Of course it is. They're saved. So what's happened to their sins? They've been blotted out. Like Peter told us, remember? Repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out and he shall send Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus appears without sin unto the saved because the sins have been blotted out. That's what it's saying. Have you sinned? Never had it. He went, to, he went to heaven bearing sin, interceding. That sin has now been erased, friends, from the record books. We're going to see that very clearly. And now he is returning to those who are afflicting their souls, those who are looking to him, cooperating with their high priest without sin unto salvation. That's what the verse is saying. Powerful, beautiful verse. These people have been afflicting their souls, looking to their high priest. And when that high priest had finished the work of cleansing the record of sin, he comes to his people without sin unto salvation. I was going to do a whole study just on the verses surrounding this, the verse prior, and especially the next four verses, Hebrews 10, verses 1 to 4. Because it goes on to say the law was only a shadow of good things to come. It could never, with the blood of bulls and goats, take away sin, etc. So, Hebrews 9.28 is the climactic moment of the antitypical day of atonement. That's what I was saying before. If you understand the types, you're going to understand, see the gospel more fully and understand it more fully. But truth is progressive. Unless you understand the cleansing of the sanctuary in Leviticus 16 and the day of atonement, you'll never understand this verse, and that's why all the commentaries get it wrong. For example... If one doesn't understand, I'm sorry, if one doesn't believe in the Day of Atonement, if one doesn't believe in the judgment, if you don't believe in the cleansing of the sanctuary, if you don't believe Jesus is a literal high priest in a literal sanctuary, cleansing that sanctuary from sin, then you're never going to understand, understand Hebrews 9.28. And that's, as I said, why the commentators don't get it right. The commentary on it just becomes a cliche. It becomes nonsense, to be honest. And it's one of the three verses in Hebrews where Paul is actually climaxing his entire argument of the plan of salvation. This verse encapsulates Jesus' sacrifice, once offered a better sense of any, his high priestly mediation, because it's, going, it's over, he's coming back without sin, he's finished that work. It encapsulates the judgment, of course, the work being finished, the saints looking to their high priest, of course, they're afflicting their souls, cooperating with him, prayer and fasting and restitution. It encapsulates Christ cleansing their lives from sin in the sanctuary, as the high priest would do on the day of atonement. And, of course, his second coming to receive his people without sin under salvation. A powerful, beautiful verse. You know, the Hebrew calendar, in the autumn, on the first day of the seventh month, there was a blowing of trumpets. The trumpets would start at sunrise and they would finish at sunset. They would sound throughout the whole land of Israel. And that was a warning. For the people of Israel to prepare because the day of judgment was coming in then 10 days' time. And this day that was coming in 10 days' time, friends, is much more solemn day, much more important day than Passover or Pentecost. It's the day of atonement. I'm not saying. It was the most important day for the Hebrews of the entire year because it was the day of judgment. They knew at Passover that their sins were placed upon the Lamb. And they, they knew that that sins were then recorded in the sanctuary. We're going to see that in a moment. And it was on the Day of Atonement, the Day of Judgment, where those sins would be cleansed and they could be at one with God. But they had to get ready, friends. This is why the trumpets would blow 10 days before with fasting, humility, repentance. It's in 10 days' time that the record's going to be judged. And either their sins are going to be cleansed from the sanctuary or they're going to be cut off from the camp. Beautiful type, as we saw earlier. He that is unjust is unjust still. He who is righteous is righteous still. He's coming back without sin under salvation. Beautiful type of what Christ is doing now. Either cleansing your record of sin or it remains on record. You're either going to be judged unjust and filthy or holy and righteous. And on the Day of Atonement, when the day arrived, there was fasting. It was kept as a Sabbath. That so was a feast of trumpets. They'd be afflicting their souls, as I was saying. That word afflicting, it means they'd be humbling self. Surrendering self. They would search their hearts in true repentance. If they had an issue with a brother or sister, they would make it right before this day came, friends. There was restitution being made. They were expressing a sorrow for their sins. And they remember, those that looked to him, they'd be looking to the high priest who's standing in the presence of God for only one day a year. 
We're looking to him, praying and fasting that he's making atonement for them with God. There was one thing that stood between them and God, and that was their sins. And when the high priest, priest completed his work of cleansing the sins from the sanctuary, he came out without sin unto salvation. And he had made atonement between the people and God, and the sins were blotted out. And he gets this verse wrong. Look at the blessings that you're missing out on. You call yourself a commentator. And there'd be rejoicing, friends, for the next, rejoicing because they're one with God now. And in five days' time, they would celebrate tabernacles. They would celebrate the deliverance from bondage, especially they would remember when God delivered their fathers out of Egypt. And they would celebrate with the greatest harvest of the year, the full harvest, including the wine and the oil and the corn, etc. They would celebrate and look forward as they would dwelt in tabernacles that would never tabernacle with God and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in heaven. Beautiful, beautiful lessons. And all this was a type of the plan of salvation. In Hebrews 9.28, he's describing a people that look to him, to Jesus, their high priest, who's making atonement for them. And when he finishes his work of cleansing the record of sin, he returns to his people that look to him without sin unto salvation. Only a seven-day Adventist, and I'm in a true Adventist, can understand this text. Because every church, at least to my knowledge, denies the judgment and the sanctuary and cleansing of the record of sin. I don't know how you can deny it, but everyone does. That's how blessed we are, that we can have such precious light. And everyone's fighting it. What do you want to fight it for? It's going to save you. You remember... Romans 5, 9 and 10. His blood not only paid for their sins, but it's his life that cleanses them from their sins. That's what the high priest is doing. That's what Hebrews 9, 28 is saying, without sin, because he's cleansed their lives from sin. You can't cleanse the record of sin in heaven if they're still sinning on earth. This is particularly about 144,000, incidentally. That's why it says they're without fault before the throne of God. They're found to be without fault. They follow the Lamb wherever he goeth. So the judgment is over, the record is cleansed, Christ and his people are one, at one moment. He returns without sin to bring them salvation and they're going to celebrate their deliverance and tabernacle in heaven, just like the types in the Old Testament. But you have to understand the type. Some people make an objection and they say, well, that's the Old Covenant. What are you reading here? This is Hebrews, this is the New Testament, this is the New Covenant. And the Apostle is speaking directly about the Day of Atonement. That's what he's talking about there. When the high priest comes out of the sanctuary, the record's being cleansed, he's coming back without sin and the salvation to them to look to him. This is the new covenant. In any way, this is where I was going to go with the original study, but I'll let it go. But the old covenant types are all fulfilled in the new covenant, especially the book of Hebrews. Old covenant, of course, is a tabernacle. And the new covenant, Hebrews 8 verse 2, the true tabernacle that the Lord preached and not man. The old, the old t- the tabernacle was made after the pattern of the one in heaven. Old covenant had a high priest. And of course, Hebrews 9.11, Jesus is our high priest. In fact, he's, I think he's mentioned about a dozen times Jesus is our high priest in the book of Hebrews. Old covenant types of sacrifices like the blood of bulls and goats, especially David time, Leviticus 16. New Testament, Hebrews, Christ by his own blood entered into the holy place. The priest was the mediator, of course, in the Old Testament. And Hebrews, Christ, the mediator of a better covenant. High priest would make atonement, Leviticus 16, 13. And of course, in the book of Hebrews, in the new covenant, Christ has obtained eternal redemption for us. So, so just by saying that those types were just old covenant is a, it doesn't make any sense. If something is a type, friends, it must have a fulfillment under the new covenant, obviously. And these are types. They have atonement is a type. Of course it is. Now, this last section... Is the most important of all. We're going to see the contradictions and the hypocrisy that there is in denying the Day of Atonement and its, and its anti-typical fulfilment. We're going to look now about the blood being sprinkled on how that blood or that record of sin was brought into the sanctuary. Just a few examples. This is if a priest had sinned. This is what God commanded that they had to do. Pay particular attention to what they have to do with the blood. Leviticus 4 3. If the priest that is anointed do sin according to the sin of the people, 
Let them bring forth his sin, which he has sinned, a young bullock, without blemish unto the Lord for his sin offering. I mean, you could really get deeper into this, but I just want to focus on one point. And he shall bring the bullock unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. He, shall, he, the priest, has to lay his hand upon the bullock's head and he has to kill the bullock before the Lord. He has to put his hand on it, friends, when he confesses his sin. And the bullock is killed. And the priest that is anointed shall take the bullock's blood and bring it to the tabernacle of the congregation. Look what he does with it. And the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle of the blood seven times before the Lord. Where? Before the veil of the sanctuary. He places his hand upon the sacrifice, confesses his sin. That sin has now gone from him to the sacrifice. Everyone agrees with that, of course. But now they, the, the sacrifice is slain. They take some of the blood from the sacrifice and they bring it into the sanctuary. And it's sprinkled seven times before the veil in the sanctuary. So the sin goes from the priest to the sacrifice, and from the sacrifice the sin is recorded in the sanctuary. That's what it's saying. Now if the congregation sinned, when the sin which they have sinned against it is known, then the congregation shall offer a young bullock for the sin and bring him before the tabernacle of the congregation. And the elders of the congregation, again, they have to lay their hands upon the head of the bullock before the Lord, and the bullock shall be killed before the Lord. And the priest that is anointed shall bring of the bullock's blood to the tabernacle of the congregation. And the priest shall dip his finger in some of the blood and sprinkle it seven times before the Lord, even before the veil. Exactly the same. The congregation laid their hands upon the sacrifice. They confessed their sin. The sin is now transferred to the sacrifice. They take the blood of the sacrifice which is the record of sin, and now it's transferred to the sanctuary and sprinkled before the veil. Why before the veil? The other side of the veil is the ark, which contains the Ten Commandments, the law of God. The sins are recorded before the veil, before the law of God. They couldn't get any closer than that because you can't get through that veil except the high priest one day of the year. Now, this is what I mean by the hypocrisy. Notice what Christians do today. Maybe I should call it double, double hypocrisy is the right word. Notice what they do today. No one disagrees with this. This is God's word, friends. I didn't say this. This is Moses wrote this. 1,500 years they were doing this. The Christian churches today, you know, majority, they only want to believe in the types that suit them. For example, the church believes very much that the sinner lays his hand upon the land, lamb, confesses his sin, that lamb is slain, which is the cross, and that sinner goes home forgiven. They love all that. You won't find a Christian on earth going to, it's going to reject that part. They love all that. They're all happy with the type up to this point, but that's where they stop. Why? Because they don't want to believe that the sin remains on record. They don't want to answer in the judgment. And that's fine if you don't want to believe it, but don't teach it and lead the other people astray. They just want to believe they're saved at the cross, they're saved with the sacrifice. But the type doesn't end there. Atonement doesn't end with the sacrifice. That's where atonement begins. The professed Christian believes by faith that his sin was transferred to the Lamb. They believe by faith that the Lamb is slain on the altar or the cross. And of course, that re represents Christ. They believe all that. They believe in these types up to this point. But they want to stop. They don't want to continue to believe when the blood's taken from that sacrifice that's recorded their sins and sprinkled before the veil in the sanctuary, which obviously means their sin is now recorded in the sanctuary, and it remains there until the 10th day of the seventh month, the day of atonement, which happens to be the day of judgment. And as I said before, God's had devoted an entire chapter of Leviticus 16 to the day of atonement and the judgment. They want to, they want to stop short of believing the entire plan of salvation and the part they play in it. When someone says to you, my atonement finished at the cross, and of course people are very sincere and they mean that, of course, but ask them, why then was the blood carried, that, that carried their sin, transferred to the sanctuary? If your atonement finishes at the cross, which is the altar, the sacrifice, why then was the blood brought into the sanctuary for? What's the reason? And why is it only cleansed after the judgment is over on the day of atonement? 
You can't just believe the types you want to believe and reject the other ones. Notice how now important, notice, notice now how important it is that the record of sin had to be transferred to the sanctuary. What, notice how important it is. There was another way that it was also transferred to the sanctuary. Leviticus 6, 25 and 26. If the blood wasn't going to be sprinkled before the veil, it was this way. Speak unto Aaron and his sons, saying, This is the law of the sin offering. In the place where the burnt offering is killed, shall the sin offering be killed before the Lord. It is most holy, of course, representing Christ's perfect sacrifice. The priest that offers it for sin shall eat it in the holy place. Shall it be eaten? It's very specific. Don't eat it wherever you like. The priest has to eat it in the sanctuary, friends, in the holy place. So either by the sprinkling of the blood or by the priest being the sin bearer, he had to eat of that sacrifice that the sin has been transferred to, He's got to eat it. Either way, the sin has to end up in the sanctuary, the record of it. Through the priest eating it or through sprinkling it in the blood, on the veil. It's transferred. Remember I said the time it doesn't end with the sacrifice, but that's where it begins. Notice now how important God regarded that sin offering being eaten within the holy place. You know, in Leviticus 10, we have the story of Nadab and Abihu, sons of Aaron. They were officiating that day. They disobeyed the direct command of God and they brought strange fire. Fire came from the Lord and struck them dead. You've got to imagine if you're Aaron that day or their brothers, if Amar and Eliezer, or even Moses, he's their uncle, they're his nephews, or anyone in the camp that day. You've got to imagine how, how, what a shock, how serious, how solemn that event must have been. These two young men just been killed by God. You know, Divine judgment, I'm not saying it was wrong, of course, but I'm just saying it must have really been quite a shock, quite a, a, a astonishing, terrible thing. So Moses tells Aaron and his sons, you're not to mourn, you're not to show any kind of sorrow, you've got to keep working. And if you do, you're going to die. He says, lest you die. That's how serious it was. Because these men who had been struck dead, they had compromised the meditorial work that they were doing as priests and making atonement for the people. And God wasn't going to allow that in, in his sanctuary. It's another thing to be a sinner outside the camp, but an ordained minister within the, the camp was a serious matter. Anyway, so they had to continue working. They cannot show any sorrow. Aaron's just had two sons torched before his eyes and his brothers have to keep working. Now, Moses must have felt rightly too, that these brothers, Aaron and his sons, their mind couldn't have been on the job anymore. He can't blame them. And uh, he must have been concerned because look what he does. And Moses diligently, he sought for the goat of the sin offering. Remember we saw about the sin offering, they had to eat some of the flesh in the holy place. Moses is wondering what's going on after what's taken place. And he's diligently looking for the sin offering that, that was made. And look what it says, he saw it burnt, he saw it wholly burnt, and he was angry. He's angry with Eliezer and Ephemar, they're the brothers, the sons of Aaron. I like how it says, which were left alive. In other words, they were lucky, in a way. In a way, they were lucky. I don't blame them, I'm not criticising them. How could you react after that event? But nonetheless, Moses is the uncle, he would be just as much sorrow and pain as well. That's his brother's sons had just been killed. But his greatest concern, God bless him, this is the true minister, friends, this is the true minister. His concern is for the people's souls. And he's looking for that sin offering, and when he sees that the whole thing was burnt, he's very angry. Why is he angry? Look what he says to them. Wherefore have you not eaten the sin offering in the holy place? You weren't supposed to burn it, you know. You are supposed to eat it in the holy place. Look at the reason why. Seeing it is most holy and God has given it to you to bear the iniquity of the congregation so much for being saved at the sacrifice to make atonement for them before the Lord. You've just ruined the atonement. I don't care if your sons have just been torched. You're supposed to eat the sacrifice in the holy place. Why was it burned? That's what he's saying to them. That's how important God regarded it. That's how important Moses regarded it. You think with what had transpired that day, 
could have cut him a bit of slack. He could have maybe let it go. He's diligently looking for it. And people want, today want to tell you, you're just saved by the cross. You're saved by the sacrifice. You don't worry about the sin being transferred, all these things, these judgments. It's fairy tales they want to tell you. Go tell Moses that. The people's atonement was dependent upon their sins being transferred to the sanctuary, either by sprinkling or by the priests eating of the, of the sacrifice and being the sin bearers. Notice the next verse. He goes on to say, watch. Behold, the blood. It was not brought within the holy place. You should have eaten it in the holy place, as I commanded. He said, listen, you've got to sprinkle the blood in there or you've got to eat it. Did you realize what you're doing? The people's atonement was dependent upon their sins being transferred to the sanctuary, either by sprinkling or by the priest eating a part of it. Even under those circumstances, Moses was angry that atonement was being compromised. Now, if the atonement finished with the sacrifice, why would Moses care about it not being transferred? It wouldn't matter. He cares about it, all right. Without the Day of Atonement, the plan of salvation fails. For example, all the Christians, all Christians believe in, in Passover as a type. Passover is, a, is a, the Lamb was slain on the 14th of Nisan, mind you, between the two evenings. And Christ was died on the 14th of Nisan at 3 p.m. between the two evenings and the ninth hour. Everyone believes that. It's beautiful. He fulfilled the Passover 1,500 years. He fulfilled it the very day, the very hour, and the very day. So they all believe that Passover, of course, is a type of the cross, Calvary. Why then don't they believe the Day of Atonement, the second last feast of the year, and the most solemn of all the feasts, and the one that says more written about it than all the other feasts? Why don't they believe that has an antitypical fulfilment as well in the New Testament? Especially when the New Testament, as we saw, talks so much about a judgment to come. As I said also, Daniel 8, 14, where you have a time prophecy for when the judgment was to begin. Without a judgment, how can it be determined who has continued in sin or who has been faithful? How can Jesus say who is holy is holy still and who is unjust? Of course there had to be a judgment. The gospel requires both the Passover, which is, and the atonement. Passover is where you're justified by his blood and the atonement where you're saved by his life. The blood of Christ sprinkled brings forgiveness of sins, but they're still recorded. And the blood of Christ applied brings cleansing from sins, and those sins are forgot. But that's when God says, I will remember your sins no more. As far as this is from the west, and I'll cast them to the depths of the sea. That's when that takes place, friends. When that record is examined and cleansed, because your life is hid with Christ in God, then they're blotted out, as Peter tells us. Repent and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out in the presence of the Lord. You know, Hebrews 10, verses 16 and 17 is really climaxing the, the, the work that Christ is doing in the heavenly sanctuary. And, he's, and, and he quotes from Jeremiah 31. Twice he quotes Hebrews 8 and Hebrews 10 from Jeremiah 31, the promise of the new covenant. And God says, I will put my laws in their minds and in their hearts will I write them. And then he says, and their sins and iniquities, I'll remember no more. He remember them no more because he's written them in his heart and in their minds. I want to sin against God. That's why their sins have been blotted out. You can't erase the sins while they're still sinning on earth. So on the day of atonement, the high priest, which is of course Christ, and, and in the type, the high priest on his breastplate, he had the 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel above his heart. And the people that were afflicting their souls outside, they were, they were, their names were on that breastplate. They were one of those tribes. If they were afflicting their souls, if they were cooperating with the high priest. The high priest was one with God. He had to go through an inter- a complete um, series of, of washings and sacrifices to make sure he was right with God himself. But then when he goes before that, through that veil, friends, he's, he's representing Christ. He has holiness to the Lord, that's all the gold mitre on his forehead. And he is one with God. And those people are one with him on his heart. And then you have atonement. That's why they're afflicting their souls and their sins are blotted out. You know, Jesus says in his high priestly prayer in John 17, Thou in me and I in them, that they may be made perfect in one. And that's why you're accepted in the beloved, Hebrews 1, Ephesians 1, 6. That's what it means for the blood to be applied. The life of Christ is now lived out in them. God doesn't see their lives anymore. That old man in his deeds died. It's Christ that liveth in me now. Now, there's sermons like we're finished now, but the sermons like these may not be popular. They may be challenging. 
But friends, I can tell you on the authority of the word of God, your sins are on record and you're going to be judged. And it's better to know that now. And just professing, Lord, Lord, we did all those things in my name. And that we need. Only Jesus as your high priest, priest and intercessor can save you. You have to cooperate in just like ancient Israel did with their high priest. And when Jesus told those people, I never knew you, he wasn't exaggerating, friends. He meant every word. He did not know them. He was a stranger to them. They went to church, they read their Bibles, they preached. But they never let him in. They would call him Lord, but he was never the Lord of their life. They were deceived, friends. They were self-deceived. And it's that bad enough that they were deceiving others, attacking messages like these. This is the most attacked message, I think, in Christianity today. Commandments are not binding. You don't have to keep the Sabbath. It's been done away with. There's no sanctuary. There's no cleansing of record. There's no judgment. We're saved at the cross. And that's why the standards in the church are the same as the world. That's why divorce rates in the church are almost the same as the world. Because people think they don't have to give an account. And this cheap grace doctrine is flooding everywhere, including the Adventist church, incidentally. They're at the top of the list. If I came to you and we're having a Bible study and you're a Sunday keeper and you believe in the Trinity and etc. And we're having studies about the judgment. And I'm showing you some verses like these. The judgment's still future. You know, the sins were transferred to the sanctuary. The high priest has to block them out. God's not a trinity. You know, the Sabbath is a fourth commandment. I'm giving you all the verses, answering the objections, and you're just resisting all of them. Like what often people do. I mean, sometimes they don't. You want to eat whatever you want. You want to go to church whenever you want. You think you're resisting me. That's why Jesus said, I never knew you. That's why he says those words. It's not about your resistance. It's God's word I'm sharing with you. It's not me. There are millions of friends in this category. I've seen them come and go in this ministry. And all my life I've seen them come and go. It breaks your heart. But one day they're going to know. They won't resist anymore. But like those people there in Matthew 7, they're going to hear the Lord say, I never knew you. But the friends, the judgment message is a good news message. It's not one to be frightened of. Who do you think it is that doesn't want you to believe this? You know one of the greatest evidences for this truth? You know what it is? Apart from the, just the Bible verses, etc. One of the greatest evidence for the judgment and the day of time and the cleansing of the sanctuary, you know what it is? And nobody believes it. The Adventist church is pretty well denying it, half of them. No one believes it, friends. It's the most attacked message in Christianity today. You won't hear messages like this. Because Satan hates it, because he knows it'll, it'll deliver you, it'll give you victory. He knows if you know that it's a high priest right now, he just hit you on your behalf. He was conquered sin. And he wants to impart that life to you. That it can deliver you, friends, and it can be free, and you can be on that straight and narrow path on the way to life. And you can hear those words from Jesus, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter into thy kingdom, to thy glory. He doesn't want that for you. That's why this message is so attacked. It can bless you, friends. It will give you victory. It will help you to strive to stay on that narrow path and save you eternally. And then you can help others to come to the knowledge of the truth as well. You know, the Apostle Paul in the book of Hebrews is saying that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Thank you for joining us. Let us have a word of prayer. Gracious, loving, eternal, Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that you would reveal these things to us. We're grateful that we're willing to do thy will, that we may know what the doctrine. We pray that we'll continue to want to strive to know the truth, to live by every word that cometh, proceeded from out of thy mouth, and to help others come to the knowledge of the truth. We pray for those who struggle with these things. We pray that they would search their hearts, and in fact, indeed, as David prayed, ask you to search their hearts, and show them if there be any wicked way in them and lead them in the way of everlasting. Because we know, Lord, it's our own selfish desires that keep us from understanding and knowing the truth. Give us the victory that we may not have pleasure in unrighteousness, but come to the knowledge of the truth as it is in Christ. And be part of that company that will hear those beautiful words from Jesus. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Help us also to give this warning to help others. Help people to see that this is a message of love and deliverance. 
And while heaven is working for every soul, as angels send forth as ministering spirits, are sent, sent forth to, be, to those who shall be heirs of salvation, to cooperate with that word, to cooperate with our high priest as he intercedes on our behalf, that he may confess our name, that when now the record comes up, all you see is the righteousness of your son, and our lives are hid with Christ in God. And we're accepted in the beloved. We pray this will be our experience and for everyone that hears this message. Bless you, Lord, and bless your name. We pray in thy word in Jesus' name. Amen.